Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we'll start now. Looks like a few more people might still be joining and having some technical issues with Zoom, but uh, today's conversation will be focused around the recovery roadmap. Really, what is the ecosystem between sales, marketing, and revenue management look like uh, post COVID? We have, you know, BCAD and now post-COVID PC. Uh, and it's gonna be a very different state of the union for different hotels in different regions, in different parts of the world. Uh, but there will be some commonalities. And today we'll have a panel discussion really entertaining. What are some of the ideas, the best practices, some of the considerations that you and your community can start exploring, implementing Hope is at least that there's one good nugget uh, and takeaway to be able to leave this conversation from that you can take back to your organization and be able to start implementing in some way, shape, or form. We have got people from across the US and across the globe on this call, but from the US uh, that will be helping facilitate this conversation. We have the fabulous Kate Burda. We have with the wonderful Wendy Keel. We have Sebastian Tobler and your MC panelist here, Eric Sutphin. Uh, this is really one of our initial panels behind the International Tourism Resource Network, with the notion of really having a two-way dialogue. So we want to be able to not just be more talking heads, putting out information into the uh, network out there. We really want to centralize the conversation and bring them all under one house in a, also a way that we're getting feedback from business owners, from the community about the pain points, the questions, the concerns that you guys are having and keeping you up at night. So with that said, in the chat feature, I am going to share a Google Doc that uh, has the space for you to be able to add some questions that if we don't quite address them and you want to be able to uh, have us dive a little deeper into whatever, uh, feel free to put that in there. If you have feedback following this that you'd like to be able to anonymously leave some feedback, information or there's a space in there as well. And at the very end, the panelists information and contact information uh, is there if you want to be able to have an offline conversation one on one with them. But we're ourselves sharpening our skills to be able to provide the most impactful educational information that can actually be action oriented uh, for the community at large. So would love not just to, to share great information, but to get some feedback about how we can serve the industry better ourselves. With that said, I'm gonna give some introductions to the panelists, and then we can be able to dive into some of the substance really about how we can be able to get back uh, on our feet and start opening uh, the hospitality domain. We have from Houston, Texas, Kate Burda, behind Kate Burda and Company. She is a, has a consulting firm focused on revenue acceleration. Overall uh, revenue strategy and profitability focus. They do this by elevating and playing within sales, traditional as well as digital marketing, as well as revenue management with what they call the revenue trifecta. They are passionate about how to think differently and be relevant uh, and differentiated in a very crowded marketplace. Loving the challenge uh, behind the status quo and challenging that as well as legacy uh, they want to live and give way to innovation and revenue growth for their customers. Their core customers are investors, owners, brands, and management companies. They've worked with companies such as Marriott, Lowe's, Goldman Sachs, and other boutique uh, independent hotels and clientele such as the Abbott. It has been the head of revenue within uh, REIT, the VP of Revenue for CSM, as well as for Hyatt Hotels. With 28 plus years of experience, she's led teams through 
uh, deposition, bankruptcy, financial downturns, and the shifts in the marketplace. So it has a lot of relevant experience for the times today and the, the changing landscape. Receiving her MBA from the University of Colorado, she is currently based out of Dallas, Texas, not Houston, Dallas. Out of Los Angeles, Ms. Wendy Keel has Wendy Keel Consulting. Until recently, she has been the Vice President of Tourism Insights for Los Angeles Tourism and Convention Board for the last eight years. She saw, oversaw all of tourism-related research and data analysis, enabling the organization and its members to formulate well-informed marketing and sales panels and make fact-based business decisions. She is acknowledged for expertise in tourism data and marketing strategy and presents a wide range of travel industry conferences and seminars. Prior to the LA Tourism, she was Director of Consumer Insights for Universal Studios Hollywood for 12 years and managed an internal consumer research department that designed and executed, designed and executed as well as analyzed research influencing strategic, operational, and marketing objectives for the theme park. She was the Director of Market Research for Walt Disney Imagineering for nine years and the Senior Manager in two at two hospitality and consulting firms. More that I can't pronounce. Awesome, I love this. This is a tongue twister this morning. Uh, uh, is now uh, in Los Angeles and uh, formerly Philadelphia. Um, she has a master's in hotel administration from Cornell University, an MBA from the University of Miami, and a bachelor of speech from Northwestern University. We also have us uh, joining Sebastian Tobler. Sebastian has done so much, I'm not gonna be able to even do it justice. Sebastian, would you be able yourself just to shed some light on uh, who you are in the marketing realm? I'd love for people to, to know who you are. Sure, absolutely, thanks Eric. Um, so uh, I am an independent consultant and my, um, on the marketing side of things with a focus in hospitality. Uh, my primary goal is really to take uh, upper funnel um, uh, initiatives and offline initiatives, bring them online and, and translate them into, into bookings and conversion. Um, so in a nutshell, that's where my focus is. Um, I've spent a, a little over 12 years in the hospitality world. Prior to that, I was in, um, in the finance world with a focus in real estate. And um, really uh, on the marketing side and, and finding ways to, to bring um, a lot of the unique attributes of independent hotels and boutique hotels um, to life online um, and to integrate it with uh, all the strategies across the board with regards to sales, marketing, and operations. Um, yeah, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Thank you for joining us this morning. So overall, we've got, you know, uh, a new landscape. The world is confronting something that we collectively have not had to address, but we've got between those here, some really innovative and disruptive panelists that have continued to be an influence in shaping the industry. And we'll have some ideas that we can be able to take home and address ourselves into our own organizations. With that, I'm just gonna start at a super 30,000 foot level of how should we be thinking about the response to COVID from a strategic standpoint, how should we be framing the challenges of COVID and how that is going to change our, our business approach, our consumer approach, our hotels from operations, messaging, sales, marketing, all of these, without getting into the weeds, how are you guys thinking about this and what are the conversations that you're having with uh, your clients about how they should be viewing the landscape post COVID. Kate, why don't you share yeah. a little bit about how you guys are tackling this? Yeah, um, so here's, here's the thing about uh, COVID is that COVID was the catalyst, the catalyst for quick change, but this change has been coming. Um, not necessarily as far as a virus and, and and um, you know the kind of the um, 
viral side of everything, but our industry was ripe for disruption and elevation. So, uh, you know, if we were to look at how uh, sales and marketing and revenue management behaved post 9-11 and post financial crisis, we were unsuccessful. Uh, the, on the marketing and sales side, the cost of acquisitions skyrocketed and, and our profitability went down. On the revenue management side, uh, we saw a lot of uh, decrease in price to try to create demand. And so what we're seeing in, in the space is there's a lot of conversation about when the economy returns, rather than how should we be re reinventing ourselves, what we should be looking at to try to look at not only from uh, our competency standpoint of what skills do we need for the future state and do we even have those skills in in house and, and within our teams uh, but also how does that customer approach look different than it had before um, and before we were very reactive in our sales we we our focus was was by and large on that transactional end rather than on that consultative side where you're you're on the transactional side you're, you're really uh looking at price and product and and it can be you know a kind of a death spiral as far, as far as price so what we're looking at is hey this is really a slowdown to speed up that in no in in no way shape or form would i have ever wanted this to happen, but it does give us this time to use to say, hey, listen, just because we have a very experienced team doesn't mean they have the skills to be effective in the future state within sales, marketing, and revenue management. And what are some of those strategies that, that really need to be present for us to be competitive in the future state? Because in all honestly, on honesty, on a top line revenue side, we were just eking by uh, prior to this uh, with our profitability. Yeah, very, very true. Wendy, I know you've got some sporting statistics and data behind this, and I'm gonna uh, shift gears over to you to, to talk about how, from a statistical standpoint, we should be looking at this. What are true consumer confidence? What are the numbers saying? Yep. And, and Perhaps that can also paint some context as to how we should be, uh, what lens we should be viewing this through, so. Okay, so I have it in a presentation form because that's what data people do on this. So um, what I'm gonna show all of you is a compilation of research that's been conducted by all the major travel and tourism research companies, not just hotel, but looking at the whole travel and tourism industry as a whole. And uh, they have been doing a fabulous job of fielding research and forecasts and analysis and so on free to support the industry. And they have a bunch of webinars or panels every week and I watch about eight to 10 of them. So what I've done is I've pulled slides from these various sources that I think are relevant and give a good picture of where we are right now on it. So I wanna start with hopefully some positive news and calling it the green shoots because we are start seeing um, some, some growth. All 50 states are open to some extent or another, uh, but it is going to be a slow growth, but we are seeing these green shoots. So I wanna go through those slides that support that. So the first one is just, uh, um, well, these slides aren't quite coming out quite right, but anyway, hmm, unfortunately, this is a slide that Tourism Economics puts together on what the spending is in the United States on travel. Um, and they do this for the US uh, Tourism or Travel Association. And what it's showing you is you can see this steep decline in the spending in the United States, but now that it's leveled out, and if the numbers had shown up, and I don't know why they don't, we're actually seeing now the spending increase. So that's, that's good news. We're on the next one. Hopefully these show up a little better. Okay, um, looking at the consumer research and how they're feeling about the economy, you can see that over time, since this study was fielded by SCIF research, if you're familiar with them, and comparing 
where it was say in March or February to May, we're starting to see the decline in people who are saying that the economy is much worse and an increase in those that are saying slightly better. And we know that certainly a driver of demand for travel and tourism is how people are feeling about their jobs and the economy and so on. So that's some good news there. Going to the next one. Um, people were also asked, this is by Destination Analyst, a very good research firm, as all of them are that I'm showing you, asking people, um, if, are they avoiding travel until the crisis blows over? And again, we're seeing that that's starting to, uh, it peaked in that first week of March. Um, and it's now, back, and then it got even higher and higher around the middle of April, early April. That's when really things were the, were the most concerning about how people felt about traveling. And we're now starting to see that decline. So in May, the first it, through the eight and 10 when they did the survey, we're back to what they felt like in March. And we hopefully start to see that decline in that they're not going to um, keep avoiding travel. Go on to the next one on that. Looking at bookings, this is from a firm in Adara, and they tra track bookings for both flights, flights and hotels. And you can see that cliff that it fell off, of course, early on. But where those red circles are, starting to see some growth here. So, I mean, and it is in the leisure. The red line is business. Um, the blue and purple are leisure, both the with families and without. And we are seeing the strength, at least early on in travel trends, is in the leisure market with um, business lagging behind that. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Okay, go on. Um, perceived safety on that. Again, comparing March to May, the perceived safety of various travel activities. And this is the percentage of people who said they think it's safe or very safe. So the activities that are considered the safest are non-team outdoor recreation. Everybody wants to get outside. We've been cooped up, but we also feel it's the safest and uh, the most effective way to do some social distancing. Road trips, very much high on the, higher on the safety. Visiting friends and relatives, that's going to be a primary driver of immediate travel as everybody wants to reconnect with their friends and family and then shopping. But looking at the lower end where what's perceived as being the least safe, it's gonna be a little difficult for cruises for a while. They're really going to have to earn back the trust of, of their uh, clients. Though people who love cruising, love cruising. Um, but also international travel, that's going to take a long time to come back. Conferences, conventions, live performances, business travel, and then air travel. And I'll talk about that a little bit more too. We have uh, in the middle there are the hotels about the perception of safety there. It's, uh, it's less than 30% of travelers at this point feel it's safe to stay in a hotel. And that certainly indicates to, to rebuild that trust and communicate with people who want to stay travel and stay in hotels that all the safety precautions are being taken and they should trust that they'll be taken care of. Go on the next one. I'm looking again at, at conferences and conventions. Again, they, that will be probably one of the last ones to recover, at least the larger ones, but it is getting a little better. You know, you can see that it's starting to decline in terms of the percentage of people who feel that a conference or a convention would, is unsafe. You know, still pretty high at almost two thirds, but it is starting to, to come down. So that's, that's good news. Okay, we'll go on to the next one. So now I'm gonna to shift to the trip planning and what people are doing at this point in terms of returning to travel. So this is really the anatomy of the recovery according to tourism economics. They are a subsidiary of Oxford economics, but they focus totally on tourism. Uh, so initially where we are right now is leisure and especially the drive market. Is, uh, uh, that's what people are looking to do and, and we see most of that travel. As we move into the secondary recovery, we'll get into essential business travel, those that really you know, have to travel on business. Maybe the small and medium sized groups, more regional, more local for sure. Um, and regional, international. Within the United States, it'll probably be Mexico, Canada first. Within Europe, it will be intra-Europe in there, just more regional. And then the final recovery is going to be the long haul international and the long events. Um, unfortunately, that may take up to 2023 to really actually completely recover to what was quote unquote normal. Can go on to the next one. 
just some statistics here on it about what people say they will do um, if, as their first trip after uh, travel bans and so on are lifted, which are in most states are starting to lift. And about 84% still say we're going to stay in the United States. Um, and that we are, as I say, drive, but fairly long distances. You know, they're going to, if you actually did four or 539 miles and you're driving, that takes you up to about seven, eight hours at least. And we did see over Memorial Day that people were taking longer trips in their cars than we had seen before. The popular places to go, again, are those outdoor places. Anybody who has a beach destination or a park, outdoor recreation. 55% do stay. say they will stay in a hotel. Um, the rest, you say, well, if they're not staying in a hotel, where they're staying, there is home sharing, campgrounds, RVs are doing very well. Um, there are alternative lodging that they're going to stay in and visiting friends and relatives, because that is people do want to connect with their families. Um, they will go to restaurants. Usually it's higher than this, but in not all locations are the restaurants open. You know, so again, if they're going campgrounds, RVs, visiting friends and relatives, they may not actually be frequenting restaurants. This last statistic is really important. It's almost 80% said they're going to research their destination and see how that destination is managing the COVID. Are, are they open? Are the restaurants open? What are the, the hotels are doing? Because it's not consistent across the United States and it's not consistent across the world. Um, so people are going to say, will I be quarantined? What exactly is going to happen? So it's really important for the destinations, hotels, whatever, to communicate what is your destination, your property doing about COVID um, so they have that information when they're coming in. Doing a spontaneous uh, kind of you know, wing it vacation is not a good idea at this time. Go on, on to the next one there. Eric, you can move that. Uh, millennials will lead the recovery, um, mostly just because they lead everything these days. They're the biggest travel cohort, so it makes sense that they're going to, to lead it. Um, but we do have the research is telling us 40% of them will make travel a high priority in their lifestyle as it has been. You know, it's just, it's something that, that is just part of the life, lifestyle and we don't expect that to change any because of the COVID. It's double the number of what a baby boomer says. They have a higher sense of safety for themselves and travel. And this is a group that can be motivated by discounts. Um, but let's just talk about discounts just for a second. What we're seeing is that to discount where there's not good value, you know, for example, if the hotel, the pool's not open, the fitness room's not open, there's not restaurants, it's not the same experience, you can discount quite a bit, but the value is not there. You know, so there's got to be other ways to look at adding value to the experience and just discounting is not necessarily going to drive. All right, go on to the next one. And that pent up demand is very real. People, you can hear people talking already about, oh God, I've been cooped up for eight, nine months and I wanna get out. Um, we are seeing a shift though in what those trips are. So we're seeing again, as I've talked before, the shift to the drive from the fly and the shift from the international to the domestic. Um, that is changing a little bit over time. You see less and less of them saying they're gonna shift from um, their domestic to the international. But I think we're not gonna see as much outbound um, American travelers or inbound international. Going to the next one. You know, but this is a, is a good opportunity uh, for you know, the United States or any, any destination looking at their domestic market. And unfortunately, I'm sorry that this is not showing up. But the blue bar, the tall blue bars were showing both the United States and Canada what the outbound was in 2019. The lower one was, was the, the, the inbound was, and then that lighter blue is the Delta. And it would show, well, there's a lot of opportunity. If all those people who would normally have traveled outside of the United States or outside of their country now stay within their country to travel, that's a lot of opportunity. That's a lot of trips. Go on to the next one. On that, again, changing the destination choices, as I talked about, beaches come up real high. You know, people want to get out and we're seeing a lot here in Los Angeles, almost too many people actually on the beaches on it. Um, but small towns and countryside, people wanting to get out to, to, so if you're located in a smaller area, more rural destination, uh, people are just feeling safer in those environments. National parks are becoming far more popular, um, cultural heritage and so on. Um, where the biggest challenge is going to be is in the urban centers, particularly the city center hotels, the big box 
convention hotels, that's going to be a challenge. You want the next one? Um, air and road trips. I've talked about this before, but now this, this chat, uh, chart from Destination Analyst shows you the timeline of uh, when people are going to start to fly again. And you can see from the car ones, the blue ones, you can see in July and so on, the, the, the road trips are coming up very high. It's going to be a long climb for the airlines uh, or for uh, air trips. And at least before 2021, people are even going to consider that. And that is really going to be totally dependent on what the airlines do, you know, relative to it storing confidence and trust again among their passengers that the planes are safe. Um, that's, they're doing the best they can on that, but they really have to restore that confidence and then go back to the capacity they had. And they're already changing routes and all kinds of things are happening in the airline industry. But the long haul in the international, it's going to follow what happens with the airlines. You can go on the next one. And that probably won't be till 2021. Looking at the lodging choices and the perceived uh, safety, you know, on that, we do see that in most cases, people do perceive safety in hotels higher than the home rentals. Um, that, that differs a little bit, but in general, the hotel, the brands are doing a great job. Marriott came out first with their protocols, but everybody else is following suit. And that shows in the data of the preferred accommodation choices is that the brands are doing better. Um, and I do believe a lot of it just has to do with they got out there and they're trying to restore that confidence and communicate with their customers and their guests that we got this, you know, we're going to uh, take care of you and our hotels are going to, they're going to protect you as best we can from that on it. So, okay, go on to the next one. And I think this is my last slide. This is just what STR, I'm sure most of you are familiar with what they do and they're tracking all of the lodging and it kind of puts all of this together. Their president said, regardless of the timing, the leisure segment will be the first out of the gate, especially from the drive markets. And then Adam Sachs, who's the president of Tourism Economics saying the initial recovery, it's gonna be uneven, it's gonna be staggered, it's gonna be very different from regional uh, region to region. Um, it will very much depend on what the local destinations and policies are and how they're communicating that. So STR came out with their latest uh, forecast of what 2020 is gonna look like, 2021. Uh, supply act is decreasing in 2020. As we know, hotels have closed, taken rooms off, but it goes back up to about 7.7% compared to 2020 and 21. This economic supply has to do with the temporary closure. It's a little hard to understand, so I'm going to go skip over that. Um, but look at what happened to demand. We're on a pretty good, you know, 2019 was, was good and 2020 was looking good until we fell off the cliff. And now the demand will be down 45% but we'll start to recover in 2020 at 49. Occupancy dropping 45%, uh, but recovering in 2021 compared to 20. ADR, big drops in ADR, and then of course in rev par. So in most forecasts, it's, it looks like it's gonna take up to maybe 2022, maybe as late as 2023 to have reco full recovery back up to 2019 um, levels. And I think that's it. Right? Um, my last slide? Yeah. That's it. So with that said, share with me, Sebastian, what are your thoughts regarding uh, the messaging? Oh, if all, a lot of this has to do with consumer confidence, how are you sharing from a marketing messaging standpoint to your clientele? How are, are they best able to reinforce and reinsure their audience? Yeah. Um, well, I think, I think everything that Wendy just touched on really is the fundamentals. That's where I would always start. And a couple of things just to reassure everybody in the marketing world, content is still king. And the channel distribution and channel marketing process has not changed because of this crisis. So all the tools um, that were, were at our fingertips are still there. It's just that content has changed and where we should be shifting our focus has changed. Um, you know, before, before the pandemic, we saw significant increases in inventory in the marketplace. Um, we saw that um, ADR was starting to slump. And the story was on the marketing side of things is how do we justify uh, maintaining ADR, especially in the boutique world. 
uh, independent world. How do we maintain a high ADR, um, uh, you know, given all the competition? And really, that was in the storytelling. You know, how how do we tell a better story so that we can we can command that? And that translated to what happened offline as well. What what kind of experiences can we offer our guests um, to to justify that 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 higher ADR? Obviously, you know now that that's shifted completely, um, and I think the the primary takeaway is people want to get out. People still want to get out. They, in fact, they want to get out more than they ever have before. We we see that, you know, over the you know this past weekend, it was Memorial Day weekend. People are dying to get out. Um, so the goal really is, you know, can we focus domestically? Can we focus on upper level messaging? And can we focus on communicating what our process is uh, uh, across the board? Um, and so what that means is, you know, what can, we, what can we say? How can we remind people that, you know, your, your hotel or your destination is still worth dreaming about? Um, how do we continue to say, hey, you know, like this is where we are. And who do we say that to? Obviously it's local. So we're not we're no longer in LA marketing to New York, for example. We shouldn't be doing that. We should be marketing um, all along the West Coast, up and down, um, you know, the PCH basically, the Pacific Coast Highway. Um, we should be focusing on all the drive markets, um, and 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 what we should be saying to them is that we are still a dream destination. That's really ultimately uh, the the messaging that we should go out there with. Um, in terms of you know what it means offline. So I think uh, my personal opinion is that I think that everybody still wants to, you know, try all the great foods in your area. They want to try all these offerings. They just obviously, we, you know, it's, it's kind of dangerous right now and, and, and it's hard to, to bring that together. So the question I always pose uh, to my clients is, how can you partner with local restaurants? How can you partner with local chefs? What can you do to bring that in-house to your guests? And then how do we market that? And it's really hyper hyper focus on 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 who's in your immediate you know who your immediate neighbors are in the F and B and hospitality world, and kind of say hey you know you can still come to Los Angeles for example and still experience these you know James Beard winning restaurants and what they have to offer, but we'll bring it to you, or here's a modified version of that, and so you can continue to bring that to the to the guests because they they still want it, um, but we just got to make sure that it's all you know it's all it's all communicated and it's all safe. And I think that's what, what's, what the marketplace wants to hear. Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, Sebastian and, and Wendy just bring up some amazing information. And, and I want to uh, kind of highlight some of the things that Sebastian is talking about. Um, first of all, kind of from, this whole, from the side of ADR, um, we, we're gonna have incredible, you know, deep, like Wendy illustrated, we're gonna have incredible uh, decrease in demand. Fair enough, you know, and the two elements that the two elements that drive demand are sales and marketing. They're the our de demand creators. Revenue management manages established demand. So, so number one, you know, just because demand is down doesn't necessarily mean that ADR is down. Going back to what Wendy said about um, talking about value, and Sebastian uh, kind of brought it up for, uh, further. If demand's down, that doesn't necessarily mean we open up our floodgates as far as rates and discounts. What that means is of the demand that's coming into the marketplace, it's much, it's much lower, but we have to understand what that constrained demand is for the marketplace. It's interesting, just this week, um, I got uh, two offers from two uh, hotels, one of which was the Ter uh, Terranea Resort there in LA, and I want to I want to commend them. Their content, like Sebastian was talking about, was not about the hotel, and and this is what I mean about we really have to start shifting and elevating our perspective. It's not about the product or the price. The more we start moving away from the product and price and start really focusing on the customer and how to relate to the customer the more we win. So let me take that Terranea Resort um, example. They did a whole release about the sea lions coming back to the Terranea area. Mm. And, and for us, it urging people to come and see, uh, and, and kind of one of the positive things about COVID has been, you know, how our, plant, how our planet is healing in different ways. 
And so this created this whole emotional attachment to, I need to go to see Ternia to go see these sea lions. In the same, the day prior, a competitor of theirs uh, came out talking about discounted pricing and here's what's going on in the hotel and, and we're an amazing hotel and take advantage of it because we're not, you're not going to get this price very long. Oh, and by the way, here are all the things that are closed. It goes exactly to what Sebastian was saying. And so just the customer sentiment of those two almost parallel um, strategies is completely different. One says, come stay at our hotel, we need the business, right? Um, and it the actual com conversation actually devalues it by just even discounting. The other says, come see something special that, that we haven't seen in a long time. Mm. And, and while you're here seeing this amazing thing, come stay with us. Two totally different mindsets. Um, and so again, kind of going back to, to what I put forward in our big, beginning of our conversation, Within sales and marketing, we've been so driven by product and price that we've actually lost focus of what is the customer needing that goes beyond our stuff, right? That goes beyond our four walls. Why do they want to come here and how should we communicate that versus a promo or a, you know, a discount, um, particularly in a time when the, when the nation knows um, that, that hotels are needing the business. So in this new landscape, <laughs> testing that is going to be essential. No one's going to get it right, right off the bat. And we're going to have to look at a very agile, dynamic landscape in between sales, marketing, and revenue management to see and test what's working. How are you recommending we look at fostering this culture of experimentation and how are we rewarding uh, these little micro wins and, and by trying and incentivizing um, our revenue managers, our marketing teams, how should we be looking at uh, timelines and, and testing these new offerings and, and what's working and what's not? Well, um, a lot of the conversation that I've been having with clients is really looking at that foundation. And within our company, we talk about what is the foundation? How, how, do we, how do we go to market? What's our strategy? And then building a framework on top of that and then focus being the cadence and the incentives. But not to sound harsh, but this is a time where um, we're really having to challenge, I'm challenging our clients with the most love and respect of saying we have to approach this different, differently. We have to have different types of conversations and we have to have a different methodology and an approach than we have before. Um, so it, it's not, um, what I'd like to think of it is it's not a right turn of what we were doing in the past was bad. It's we have to elevate our level of play to be formidable and relevant to our customers in, in this world. And then let's build on some framework so it becomes it, this uncom or what's not comfortable becomes common. And then let's talk about how do we have this, how do we have focus, governance, cadence, um, and incentive programs that are aligned with our new approach to the marketplace. Um, but it is, it, there, there is a lot of transition in thinking and knowledge base that has to happen. And it should have been happening, but we were kind of, we, we were able, we didn't have to do it. We, we were kind of able, because the markets were bigger and it were, 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 more, were more robust, we were able to kind of get away with it. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine, I, I love your thoughts. How in this agile testing environment, how are we, you know, evaluating and approving the potential efficacy of these new plans? How are you, would you guys be looking at with your clients what's going to stick and, and how long to stick with those new plans? Um, so for right now, I mean, you know, it's, it's also to, to, Kate, you know, to Kate's point, we have to re-examine everything top down. And I think from, from a marketing perspective, that means redefining success. Um, and what does that mean? 
you know, the first people I talk to about goals uh, within a hotel um, is the revenue managers. What are your goals? Let's define the goal for this month, this quarter, this, this year, et cetera, so that, you know, marketing can work against that. Obviously, this time around, it's a little different. You know, I, I always touch base with my revenue managers and it's occupancy really oriented. It's occupancy oriented at the moment. But from a marketing perspective, I think um, success is the integrity of your brand. Uh, success is the, uh, the dream that you promise your guest. Uh, and, to, and to maintain that and to make sure that that, that stays alive throughout all of this. Um, Wendy's numbers kind of say it all. You know, 2021 demand plus 49% increase. What do you do leading up to that so that when 2021 comes around or leading up to 2021, People are staying, they're thinking about your property, they're thinking about your destination. Um, it's, it's really super long-term and it's soft um, you know, on the marketing side. But if I were to translate that into analytics, it is how many people are still looking at the content I'm putting out there? How many people are still signing up for emails? How many people are still clicking through my website to see what the, you know, what, what the, uh, what the um, what our process is, what our what our changes are, how many people are still engaging with us on social media, uh, who's sharing our videos, and how do we continually, you know, harness that data for the for the long term, because now is the time to really build that database. Now is the time to really build out that audience, because, you know, once you have that significant growth, you can really really action against it. When it's time to um, when it's time to, to to really go after conversion. And Sebastian, I don't know if you're seeing the same thing that we are in our business, but just the amount of people that are online and and viewing content, mm -hmm. it's it, <laughs> we're not yeah. going to see this again. So you Absolutely. better you, if you're not taking advantage of it now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. True. yeah, absolutely. And and to this is sort of like. Um, it just sort of speaks to that. Okay, so it, in Los Angeles, the film industry is in a, in, a, in, a, in a bind because there's a significant demand for content for escapist, uh, escapist content. You know, everybody's asking, who's got a solution to provide content that's all about travel? There's so much demand for stories abroad right now, but nobody can make it happen to the point that uh, they're reaching out to commercial production companies and saying, hey, have you, do you have anything stock wise that you shot so we can start, you know, incorporating into our storytelling? And I think that should be indicative of the overall demand that, you know, that there are people who are, who are you know, they're just dying to, to, to dream, to get out. We really do in the literal sense, have a captured audience, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it's really about making sure that you, you stand out and, and uh, that they remember you. Um, throughout this entire process, because they will come back and say, this is the place I'm going to as soon as all this is over. So and I'm going to bring everybody with me. With that, we've got a question. Thank you for those of you that have been putting a few questions in uh, the Google Doc regarding some questions and feedback. Along that vein, really, uh, how are you guys seeing the potential to unite hoteliers to market the destination instead of just individual hotels or secluded areas. What is that ability to storytell, to change the narrative in a way that brings everyone together uh, to market the destination? Um, Tulum has done a great job of this. I just talked with the CEO of Colibri and he was sharing, Tulum as a brand has done a wonderful job uh, thus far that their direct bookings we're like 90% forever. How do we change the landscape in being able to, to do that here forward? So can I jump in on that one? Please. Again, on that, uh, coming from a destination marketing organization or the CVB, um, you've, you should be working with them if you're not. And, and quite honestly, the, it's, it's been a very siloed experience for me. The hotels do their thing, the re restaurants that do their thing. And it was very, very hard to coordinate that together. And, and in some cases, even getting the support. 
on that. But as I would say at meetings and so on, you'd have with the hoteliers and so on, you know, quite honestly, nobody wakes up in the morning and say, I just got to go to LA. You know, something has to inspire them. Something has to tell them, this is the place I want to go. And quite honestly, because you have a Hilton or a Marriott there, that's not the driver of the visit to Los Angeles. It's what everything else Los Angeles has to offer. So if you're not working with your destination marketing organization, you really should be, you know, because that's where the whole message can come together. And then they can pulse it out to say, this is the destination that you need to come to and we're ready for you. That's in the message as well. And then from there, they'll, the, your customers will decide where they're gonna stay and what they're gonna do. But I, I, I'm hoping that this is a moment where the destination marketing organizations, unfortunately their budgets are being decimated as well because they rely on hotel taxes and so on. It's a real struggle, um, but I think you need to get behind them for just this point that we're discussing. Kate, I see a nod. Do you have additional thoughts around kind of this rally cry around location and how does that influence? Yeah, I, I was thinking, yeah, what I was thinking about is, is um, um, you know, this, if I had a rally cry, <laughs> it would be for us to be really, uh, really, under, really understand the customer. And I think it goes back to um, Sebastian highlighted a little bit where, uh, you know, he would talk to revenue managers and say, hey, what are their goals? And, and in our work, what we see is there's a lot of financial goals and there's a lot of tactics. But as far as that connective tissue between, you know, financial expectations or goals, and tactics is this strategy. And, and what we see is, is this lack, either a lack of strategy or misalignment. Um, and so that's one thing of, of really understanding, getting to this real understanding of what does real strategy look like for the future state. So, uh, you know, the, in this whole thing, um, there are companies that are looking at how do they reinvest? How do they, how do they actually move forward and start investing in different ways? And what I see is a lot of times our sales and marketing people don't have those, uh, don't have those relationships or connectivity to those, uh, to those that may be uh, really working on industries that are going to be relevant and important in the future state. Let me give you an example. Um, Ford, and I've used this example a couple different times, um, and there's many different companies that are that are like this. Ford, their you know their workers, the auto workers, just returned this week. But up until this time and going forward, they've been completely focused on PPE and personal protective uh, equipment, and and that has that is. Uh, that's a demand creator. There, there's things that are happening within Ford that create an organizational response that we need to be a part of. Where we're having issue or where, where I'm talking about of elevating our conversation is so many times our sales and marketing wait until the point of sale where they're interacting with third party intermediaries or OTAs or national sales or, or whatever that conduit is. And they're getting at that lead and they're reacting at that lead when the cost of acquisition is extremely high and it's going out to everybody, you know, it's going out to, to everybody. What we, what we look at is, hey, how do we start having this foundation, this new way to work? So we start having conversations at Ford versus waiting for it to be a lead. How do we start having those conversations with Deloitte and uh, that it, they're investing millions in, in uh, infrastructure that um, another one is, um, uh, you know, the pharmaceutical industry and, and um, Medtronic with ventilators and things like this. So being able to kind of peel away what we've always done and talk about our stuff and our product and our cool, you know, this is whether we're boutique or we're a big brand, how do we start having conversations at the point of inspiration? And that could be from a corporate standpoint. It could be from, I got to get out of here because my, I just have to get out of here because I'm sick of being in Dallas, Texas, and I'm going to go to the Big Bend region of, 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 um, of Texas. But understanding that point of inspiration 
versus circling all of our work around the point of sale. This is going to be no doubt a, a team effort to ultimately serve the guests. That's our job in hospitality. Uh, to do so, that might mean in this new landscape, we're going to have to change some of our brand standards, some of the things that we otherwise might not have uh, been open to before. Um, for instance, you know, you might have a luxury property that you, you said we're not going to play with OTAs, we're not going to touch Groupons before. How and where should we be looking at evolving um, our own strategy on property or for our portfolios to say, let's, let's take a deeper dive, let's look at this. How can we be innovative? How can we foster uh, a different approach that is going to be successful for us? Can you, any three of you shed some light on how you, you uh, are gonna look at what is kind of the new um, benchmark stuff that you otherwise might not have done. How um, when is that acceptable now? Well, from a channel marketing perspective, um, if there were a, ever a time to, to band together um, and coordinate a, a, a push, you know, for example, Tulum, right? What you brought up Tulum. Um, it, you know, it's not necessarily sharing our database, but one of the things that I've, I've done um, for destinations with um, with different brands, with hotels, you know, with hotels, different brands, and we we would create a sort of a destination push. So we would say, all right, let's all get together. You know, you, you know, we're in trouble here. How to you know how do we leverage the destination for all of us as a third party, right? Um, and then we would unify under a single marketing banner, whatever it is. We'll you know we'll call it like you know, Dream Tulum, for example. Um, and we'll have, you know, we'll work with all the revenue managers across the board. And this is sort of aspirational sense, but like creating a single rate, for example, you know, if it's rate oriented, this is what we did for one client before the pandemic. We'll say, all right, so this destination as a whole is having a problem. We'll band together, create a third party website and say, this is like dream to loom, right? 400 bucks a night, every hotel, any hotel. And, and then you focus on, but the focus is on the destination in this third party. So there isn't a sense of, um, you know, crossing over each other's, you know, stepping on each other's feet. It's, a, it's an actual drive to destination. And the point is to just bring everybody there. That was, that was the goal for this particular um, campaign. And it was both future oriented and present oriented, meaning that there were obviously on, you know, rates out, you know, way out that, that were a bit more attractive to, to, to create base and there's rates immediately. So there are, there, are, there are options and the idea is to create that flexibility for the, for the guests. Um, so I, I would imagine that something like that would be, would be beneficial now, not in exactly a rate oriented sense, but in a, in a dream oriented sense, in an aspirational oriented sense. Um, and not to, you know, obviously this is a plug for ITRN, but an organization like this, like coming together where it's like, okay, so this is, this is, this is a platform now where we can bring in people. Yes. But we can also bring in hotels and say, let's coordinate within a destination. We'll build this around this marketing apparatus to promote this destination so that it isn't just singularly one hotel oriented. Um, it is the destination and here are all the great hotels you can pick from. Um, and then obviously from there, there's the technicality side of like, you know, how do we get to your site, et cetera. But that's, that's easily solvable. Um, but I, I think that's what needs to happen. You know, I think it's, I think we all do need to band together. Um, we do need to, you know, ask each other, okay, so the CVPs and DMOs, they don't have the budgets right now, but they have access. That's what they have. They have access and they have a, a big voice. Everybody knows them and they can get us out there. So what if we band together, pull our budget? Determine some sort of structure, um, and then leverage all of the all of the all of the ways we can market this through various channels um, to to bring attention to our destination. I think there's some great strategies in there. Wendy, final thoughts as we wrap this conversation up, either around this question or uh, at large. Yeah, I I I I love what everybody is saying in terms of of being a more cohesive industry you know, and coming out with one collective voice, which is really, uh, quite honestly, if you work for a DMO, that's one of the biggest struggles, is trying to get all your members to collectively have that single voice and be able to be part of that inspiration message 
of uh, getting people to come to your destination instead of just having it's my hotel, my restaurant, my tour, my attraction, and so on. And I'm hoping that this will, and all that what Sebastian was saying was will make the, the industry far more cohesive um, than it's ever been before. Because uh, I think it's needed, and there it, and it's just the right time. Because I've forgotten the gentleman who who coined this, but he talked about this as being the George Bailey moment of travel. And if you're familiar with the movie, it's a wonderful life. It it shows his life. If he hadn't been alive, what was it like? And we now are be able to see what was travel. What was the world like without travel? And it's our George Bailey moment. And if we don't take advantage of that and redo our thinking and become more collective and collaborative and think holistically, then we have really wasted a crisis and never waste a good crisis. That's right. <laughs> Kate, final thoughts, recommendations, uh, recommendations? Yeah, it's, um, it's gonna be a completely different economy. It's a completely yeah, different marketplace. Right. And doing what you've always done doesn't work any longer. Uh, and so uh, challenge, challenging the status quo, particularly as it relates to the customer, is going to be what worked in the past worked in the past. A variety of uh, perspectives. I certainly heard some great takeaways. I know that people at the top of the hour, if you have a few more moments, just an uh, invitation is to take your notes, to go back to your team, to look at how do you take a few steps back and really uh, bring some of the strategic people to the table to ask big questions, ask the powerful questions, listen carefully, explore things from a new perspective and create a new rally cry. What does that look like for your property, for your portfolio? What does that look like to unite other people within your region so that you can have a larger rally cry and voice? What should some of the new metrics and standards be that you're considering and what, how are you defining success? On this road to recovery, we need to, to be strategic and that's gonna mean going slow to go fast. And if you need others to do that, that's what this International Tourism Resource Network is here for, not just for us as businesses to share our two cents and best practices uh, to glean from, but how do we create a rising tide where we can support each other? So uh, keep a lookout and a, and a pulse for updates to come about the International Tourism Resource Network and the, the knowledge base of assets that will be available for you to be part of this dialogue. Uh, with, with that, we thank you for your time. Uh, love for you to circle back with those that invited you to this conversation and, and share what other topics, what other things are close to your heart uh, that you'd like for us to address and we can get some uh, future panels around those topics of conversation. You can be able to subscribe to the YouTube channel for more information and get involved in the community and share your own voice and perspective.